49 years ago today, the uh, Supreme Court struck down uh, every abortion law in every state in one fell swoop in this country, and it made abortion legal to every one of those states in the United States. And uh, on that topic, I could talk about how many or even how probably most of our politicians are on the wrong side of this issue, but I'm not going to. I'm not, I don't think that I could convince anyone to change their mind about politics because politics is a mindless game. Uh, it's meant to cause division and uproar and outrage, and it's about winners and losers. When a time ago it was once about presenting the best ideas and debating those ideas, it's far from that today, and it's far from the intellectual subject that it once was. So I'm not going to talk about the politics of abortion. I'm going to talk about the humanity of it. I'll explain what I mean by that. As I was trying to put my thoughts together regarding this issue, uh, a few things kept coming to mind. See, for most people, abortion is, as I said, a political issue. Uh, it's a, a matter of justice or injustice. It's a matter of right and wrong. It's a matter of good and evil, a matter of freedom or restriction. But for us priests, abortion is a very human issue. You see, most people don't actually talk to or interact with people who have been affected by abortion, but priests do. Uh, most people who have had abortions and most people who have pressured someone else into having an abortion, uh, they don't typically talk about it or, uh, you know, advertise the fact that, that that was the case. Because I'm a priest, though, they do talk to us about it. And so I would like to talk to you about the human element of abortion, not the political element. Um, as a priest, I'm more concerned with people anyways, and uh, on the individual level, I'm much more concerned with that than I am with politics. Now, don't get me wrong, the political side of abortion is a valid, valid, valid issue within the church. It is one that should affect the way that we vote. Uh, it, is, it should be a key issue for us. If it is, it is something that we must stand against. Um, but there is more that you can do about this issue than simply voting. Uh, plus, you should never put your hope in politicians. Put your hope in God and take action based off of your convictions. As I was going uh, about this homily, thinking about this throughout the course of this week, I came across a, a sermon given by Cardinal Sean O'Malley. He's the Archbishop of the, the, the Diocese of Boston, Massachusetts. And uh, I've always liked his preaching and what he has to say. Uh, I met him once. Uh, he was sort of incognito in the, the crypt church in the, the uh, National Shrine, uh, sort of avoiding people. Uh, he was just dressed as a simple monk, not as a cardinal. Uh, he's, a, uh, he's a religious priest. But... Um, uh, and I was reading this sermon that he gave, and I thought, well, this is pretty much my thoughts about it. So if you come across a homily that he gave at one point about uh, abortion, it might sound a lot the same because I'm using some of his points. But uh, he began with saying that John Paul II referred to the opposition of the church's position on life issues as the quote-unquote culture of death. And Cardinal O'Malley very wisely says this about the culture of death. He says, the culture of death flows out of the extreme individualism of our age. The church's antidote to the culture of death is community. In other words, the cardinal is saying that the, the culture of death flourishes when we focus on ourselves. When all I'm worried about is me, when all I look out for is number one, well, then the rights of others are less of a priority. If you think about the so-called progress of human history and, and look at where we are as a human race, over time we've moved to a more and more self-centered idea of living. And the culture of death testifies to that. At no other point in human history now, in the year 2022, there are more slaves on earth including the 400 years of the African slave trade. And a majority of those slaves are forced into sexual servitude. 
China and North Korea have a whole system of slave labor camps that rival the Nazis. And in these death camps and labor camps, religious and political minorities are forced into manual labor, and many of them are harvested of their organs that are sold to white Westerners in what is called medical tourism. Where is the outrage? Where is uh, the, the total disbelief and re rebellion against these realities that we live with? But th there is none because this is the culture that we live in, the culture of death. Now you add to that nearly 50 years of abortion and approximately 63 million people that were killed in the womb in this country alone, and a huge number of them were minority races that were targeted by the very people who founded organizations such as Planned Parenthood. Uh, it adds a lot more to the culture of death. So how in the world do we fight against such a culture? Well, to me, in my experience as a priest, and that's all that I can speak to because that's my experience, the answer to that is we, we fight the culture of death one person at a time. And the people that we need to be fighting for are those who are vulnerable and those who are at risk of giving in to the temptation of the culture of death. And so perhaps we need to be less combative when it comes to the political issue of abortion, and we need to perhaps focus more of our energy in compassion to those who have been affected or may be affected by abortion. The pro-life movement will seem very phony unless we actually present the merciful face of God to women who are facing a difficult pregnancy. Being judgmental or condemnatory is not a part of the gospel of life. We're often quick to judge people, mostly because we haven't walked in their shoes. And until we find ourselves in those shoes, in that same situation, we simply don't know what we would choose. We might do the same thing that we would otherwise judge other people for. Abortion simply, it's not just evil people choosing to do it. it it's an option that has crossed the minds of many God-fearing people because it's an option that people contemplate in crisis. And the people in crisis often make bad decisions because they're in self-preservation mode. They're simply trying to survive. They're simply looking out for number one. And if you look at an example from the gospel, it, this example almost exactly outlines what I'm trying to talk about. And that is the story of the woman caught in adultery. It's one of the most uh, famous scenes in the, the, the New Testament, it's sort of a dramatic scene. The Pharisees, they're, they're determined to force Jesus to choose wrongly, to choose between justice and mercy. And they think that they have him trapped because according to the law of Moses, this woman should be punished by death. So if Jesus were to say no, well, then they would accuse him of neglecting to obey the law. But if Jesus were to say yes, kill her, well, what, what kind of God would he be then? And so exactly as people still do with vulnerable people, the vulnerable women specifically, the Pharisees bring in this woman as sort of a, a stage prop to use for their political uh, purposes. And interestingly enough, but certainly not surprisingly, her accomplice in the adultery is nowhere to be found. He has escaped all punishment. And it's only the woman who pays the price for their actions. She is no doubt filled with shame and fear on top of feelings of despair and anger and disappointment, and, and I'm sure she felt lonely in that moment. And in my experience as a priest, that's exactly how it plays out. The feelings of the woman in the gospel are so like the feelings of women who are caught in a crisis of an unexpected or unwanted pregnancy. They feel overwhelmed, they feel alone, they feel afraid and confused. And abortions are so many times, in my experience, uh, even the majority of the time, they're at the demand of the pregnant mother's boyfriend or husband or family or parents. The choice, ironically, for those who are pro-choice, is so often not the mother's choice. So often she feels like she has no choice. And in so many cases, 
if there was just somebody to tell her that there was another way, that she didn't have to have an abortion, she wouldn't have. There's a reason women turn around in their tracks if they see people praying in front of an abortion clinic, because she knows that she's not alone. If only there was a support system for her and her child, abortion wouldn't need to be an option. But as is the case with most evils, the evil is most viable in desperate situations. I taught high school for a number of years in Lincoln at Pius X High School, and it probably surprise you that a large number of the students, probably a majority of them, were pro-abortion. And a big reason for that is because they perceived the pro-life movement as a bunch of angry and self-righteous Pharisees, like we hear about in the gospel passage that I just mentioned. They see us as Pharisees with stones in our hands, looking down on women in order to judge them. And they see the reality of what, what many single mothers face. And they, they see the lack of resources and the lack of help that many young mothers are left with. And that's why, rather than turning to politicians, we just need to do it ourselves. Uh, politics is about winning and losing elections. It's not about winning hearts. It's about winning and losing court cases. It's not about people. And when it becomes all about winning and losing, then the women at risk are the ones who are left out of it. So we want women to experience the merciful love of Christ. And in the gospel story, Jesus doesn't, he doesn't condone the woman's sin, but he doesn't condemn her. He's God, and he doesn't condemn her. He invites her to make a new start, to know what it is to be forgiven and to be loved. So instead of being on, on a side of an argument when it comes to this issue, we have to stop arguing altogether and simply take action. And that's precisely what things like the St. Gianna's Home in Lincoln does. It's a refuge for women who are escaping abusive relationships, women who are victims of abortion. That's why we have uh, Project Rachel, who minister to women who have had abortions. We, we, the diocese has a, a crisis pregnancy centers and resources at our Catholic social services for women who are vulnerable. That's what the Knights of Columbus do with the One Rose, One Life campaign every year to, to raise money for the pro-life uh, pro causes. Because the truth is, is that we can simply, we can save babies, we can save those who might be lost to abortion by simply saving the mothers who are contemplating abortion. When they experience God's mercy in a community that cares about them, then they'll be able to show mercy to their children. The, the pro-life movement has to be about saving mothers. There are millions of women in our country who have had abortions, millions of men who have pushed them and encouraged them and drove them to the abortion clinic. We need to focus on those women and to understand what they're suffering. And it's sort of like slavery in the past, in a sense. Many, many Americans are repulsed by abortion, but we believe that it's a necessary evil. But our job as Christians is to show that it's not necessary and that it is evil. We need to present a more humane solution when it comes to helping people through a difficult pregnancy. The, the majority of women who turn to abortion are poor. Poverty is a dehumanizing force that it leads people to feel trapped and to make them contemplate this horrible choice. Planned Parenthood, which who provides most of the abortions in the United States, uh, a lot of them anyways, is it was founded by a woman named Margaret Sanger, whose goal was to eliminate poor people, specifically racial minorities. Her most one of her most famous quotes was, there are not too many people in this world, there are too many of the wrong kind of people in this world. And this is a mission that Planned Parenthood still carries on today. Most of their clinics are in poor and minority neighborhoods. In New York City, there are more black children aborted than are born. And that's the case in a lot of cities in the United States. So not only do we need to help the most vulnerable women of our communities, we need to help them on the path to economic security too. We can't just help them through a pregnancy and leave them there. We need to think of ways to help single mothers and make it possible for them to find work in the face of 
astronomically high daycare costs and a widening wealth gap between the rich and the poor. We can rescue unborn babies from abortion by rescuing their moms from a life of poverty because that life can be often hopeless and hopelessness leads to death. So instead of putting stock in politicians based off of how we think they might vote on an issue, we can be uh, take action, we can be ambassadors of life, and we can think of creative ways to approach this issue on a human level rather than a political one. The irony is that many people think of us Catholics as people who say no to everything. Don't do this, don't do that. But in reality, we're people who say yes. Yes to God, yes to life, yes to compassion for the poor and for the suffering and for the vulnerable. Yes to a community that makes us messengers of joy in this valley of tears.